Hi, thank you all for coming. I'm Diana Shkolnikov. I work for MAPSEN uh, out of the New York office, and I lead the geocoding team. Um, and so I'm here to talk to you guys about geocoders. And um, I, was reading, I was reading a blog post uh, or a Medium article recently about what, you know, what to do when you're presenting, because I was trying to prepare for this talk. Um, and the article said, just, you know, it's all about telling a story. And so I sometimes take things a little too literally. So I'm going to actually read you a story that I wrote. Um, and hopefully this goes well. Um, so the story is about a geocoder. Um, geocoders are mysterious systems that people kind of love and take for granted and hate when they do the wrong thing. Um, and I think talking a little bit about the history and the details of what goes into making a geocoder will help to kind of uh, pull back the velvet curtain and make people less afraid um, of these mysterious systems. Um, and so, Befriending a Geocoder, written by me, illustrated by the internet, I borrowed heavily. Um, and we'll start, I'll be turning the pages and you guys can keep following along. I don't recommend you read, I'll be reading the story to you. This is for later when you wanna read this to your children at bedtime, <laughs> which I'm sure you all will. All right, our story begins a long time ago in the 1960s when the first geographical information systems began to take shape in the faraway land of Canada. Dr. Roger Tomlinson, a brilliant man, created a system that would catalog data pertaining to agriculture, wildlife, and forestry. He has since been acknowledged as the father of GIS. Look how friendly he looks in that picture. Isn't that great? <laughs> Shortly thereafter, some of the finest universities in the US, as, uh, such as Harvard and Yale, followed suit and implemented their own versions of early geospatial search engines. A team of Yale graduates and students developed a protocol they called the Dual Independent Map Encoding, try to say that twice uh, fast, DIME for short, this groundbreaking protocol paved the way for geocoding algorithms still used in some of today's most popular commercial geocoders, such as Google and MapQuest. That image is um, what they kind of use to represent the referential system, and there are links below if you guys want to follow along later to read the actual documentation for it. Quick fun fact, uh, New Haven, Connecticut, the home of Yale University, uh, was the first city on Earth with a topologically integrated geocodable streets network database. So next time you're in that city, you could tell them they should be proud. <laughs> All right, turning the page. Using the U.S. Census data from 1970 and 1980, the first automated system to store and retrieve city address data using city blocks and house number ranges was built. This allowed the user to compute the location of an address along the face of a city block. I love this picture. This was taken from the census bulletin clipping. Um, you could see this gentleman mansplaining the, uh, <laughs> the work that he does with his colleague over there, and she's intently listening. Um, I thought that was awesome. I'm glad everybody knows what mansplaining is. Sometimes you have to mansplain what that is. Um, all right. It became clear that there was a tremendous market for these amazing systems, and commercial geocoding solutions began to emerge in the 1980s. Around that time, a little company named Esri began to offer commercial geocoding services. By the end of the century, with the help of the 1990 US Census, there was enough street segment data collected to generate a brand new, never before possible data set for interpolation of street addresses. This is where it gets good, okay. <laughs> this new set of data was named Tiger. Tiger was built on top of a principle laid out by the DIME system and quickly became the foundation of every serious US geocoding solution in existence. This data set continues to be in use well into the present time. Raise, it, raise your hand if you've heard of Tiger. All right, see, great. Raise your hand if you've seen this uh, clip art magic before. Nice, I thought it was so great. It's like a high school t-shirt you would get, right, with like the logo, someone found the, the Tiger clip art, it's amazing. Someone should make these into t-shirts. All right, fast forward to the early 2000s, the geocoding wizards began to focus on parcel and rooftop data. Combining the accuracy of parcel centroids with the flexibility of tiger ranges allowed for a whole new level of precision. Those in possession of this amazing technology could easily locate an address on a map, which at that time was pure magic to the general population. These tools granted great power, but they were limited to a select few users, leaving majority of people at the mercy of crinkled up old maps and sketchy directions on the back of a napkin. 
Luckily, things began to quickly expand to the masses as personal computers and mobile devices became commonplace. The technology matured and common folk began to enjoy the benefits of these game-changing systems. Years after the first study, uh, strides in geocoding made the people believe in a magical future where any location in the world is accessible with just a few keystrokes, all the serious geocoding platforms were still owned and operated by large corporations and government agencies. This was mostly due to the fact that the data required to build a reliable geocoder was an insurmountable obstacle, requiring years of data collection in the field or millions of dollars to license such data from others. If you can't tell that, that's a, that's a boulder in the middle of a road. That's the obstacle. It, I know it's like, it's hard to see. Someone said it looks like a tank earlier. So just clarifying, that's just a big rock. Um, the, the people were also limited in how they could share the information they retrieved using these mysterious geocoders. If the answers granted to them by the geocoders were incorrect, the people were powerless to improve them. Despite the restrictions, the geocoders were so powerful and great that the people went along with the rules and demands for lack of alternatives. Fortunately, a seed was planted in 2004 by a visionary named Steve Coast. Everyone familiar? Um, he saw a future where worldwide geospatial data belonged to the very people that it aimed to represent. A project called OpenStreetMap was brought into the world with humble beginnings. By 2013, a remarkable milestone of one million contributors had been reached. That's one million individuals working towards a common goal of a free people's data set. Together, they accomplished something astonishing. And the momentum continues to build today as our story unfolds. Once OpenStreetMap data reached a level of coverage that could be used to effectively geocode, even if only in the more populated parts of the world, several experts decided it was time to start making geocoders for the people based on the only data set composed by the people. This saw a rise of a few prominent open source geocoding solutions like Nom Nominatum, Kamut's Photon, and recently Mapsend's Peleus, to name a few. How many of you guys have used a geocoder in your work? Show of hands. Nice. How many need to use one in the future and are hoping to? All right, cool. Come see us at the workshop tomorrow. I'll have more information on that at the end. Uh, oh, oops. Sorry, too soon. Uh, what geocoders thrive upon is point data. As history proved, adding parcels and rooftop point data to geocoding solutions dramatically improves their accuracy and reliability. Point data generally means one of two things, addresses or venues. Oh, I skipped a page. Ah, sorry. The top of this page? Hold on. No, I went too far. That's why reading doesn't work. Okay, I'll just read this. And the people rejoiced, for finally they had several geocoders of their own that they could nurture and train. But these geocoders weren't perfect and required much love and attention. So the dedicated OpenStreetMap contributors wanted to know what they could do to help improve these communal geocoders. What will it take to make these magical systems work like those well-established wizard-owned ones? Can they be trained? Do they respond to positive reinforcement? Do they work for treats? <laughs> what geocoders thrive upon is point data. And that's what I already read to you guys. So yes, it means addresses or venues. Um, and now, now here, sorry about that. Um, although OpenStreetMap does not have much in the way of addresses, it offers tremendous value through its rich venue data. Places like restaurants, banks, schools, libraries, and public transit stops are really important in making a well-behaved geocoder. So to help train the geocoder to fetch those places by name and category, they should be added to the OSM data set with proper tags. Some examples of those tags that geocoders ingest regularly are amenities, building, shop, cuisine, public transport, man-made, land use, craft, and tourism, to name a few. If any of these tags are found on a record, and there's also a name tag. The record gets added to the things that the geocoder will respond to correctly in the future. Geocoders are really predictable in this respect. They will only ever ingest things marked with tags it understands and know how to classify. These are some of the tags. Um, if you guys want to check them back for reference, these are the tags that the uh, Peleus geocoder pulls in during the import of OpenStreetMap data. Just a little appendix. All right, moving on. That brings us to another critical point. Names are a big deal when geocoding. Unless it's an address, if no name is specified for a venue, that venue cannot be added to the list of things a geocoder knows about. 
that which has no name cannot be searched for and found successfully. That's deep. Take that in. All right. Another helpful training tip is to add alternate names uh, for venues that might have them. These names could be in different languages or just nicknames people often use to refer to a place. Basically, the more names you can teach the geocoder to recognize a place by, the better it will become at fetching that place, no matter which one of the names you decided to use in the future request. And you could see some of the McDonald's uh, various names. So if you were putting that into uh, OSM, adding all the alternative names might be really helpful. So if there were loads of venues in OSM and each of them had a name, the geocoder would be pretty obedient when searching for venues by name. But there would still be a problem when searching for addresses. Addresses are notoriously tough to add to an open data set. And so it's not realistic, even for a fairy tale, to expect that people would add all residential addresses manually. However, if a small step in that direction could be taken by ensuring that every venue has an address associated with it, progress would be significant. As it stands, only a little over 30% of the cuisine venues have address tags, for example. Most restaurants have their addresses prominently displayed on doors, menus, and business cards, making it easy to look them up. Getting into the habit of adding those whenever a new venue is created or updating existing records to contain an, to contain an address would show the geocoder enough address points to make searching results significantly better. Still, even with all these venues and addresses, sometimes geocoders can get confused and misunderstand your requests. So you end up with results you didn't ask for, kind of like throwing a stick to a dog only to have it fetch you your slippers. It's trying to be helpful, but it's still just missing the mark. This can be happening for any number of reasons, but to help avoid some confusion, try the following tip. Avoid abbreviations whenever possible. Geocoders get stumped by ambiguous abbreviations such as ST, since it can stand for street and saint, or CT, which could mean either court or Connecticut. If there's a directional in a name or street, it's best to spell the whole thing out, like north instead of n. Having these simple tips help the people improve the data. Years into the future, all of their efforts paid off big, and the people's data reached a level of coverage and accuracy that made geocoding with anything else a ludicrous proposition. Several loyal, dependable, and ever so magical geocoders emerged and served the people well. Maps and Peleus, being one of the first, and by that time most established geocoder of the people, led the path onward and upward. The people were grateful and excited to have finally befriended a geocoder, and they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> the end. That's all the info. Um, if you guys are interested in learning more about the Peleus geocoder, which is the MapsN uh, geocoding engine that powers MapsN Search, the hosted instance, um, come and check out all of those websites. There's blog posts about what it takes to make a geocoder if you want more details um, to read to your children, obviously. Uh, the documentation for the API is on the docs page. And the GitHub account, everything we do is open source. So the Peleus engine is entirely open source. You could go check it out. It's written in Node.js um, and uses Elasticsearch in the back end. Those are the only two dependencies that we have. We pride ourselves in having very few of those and making our stuff easy to install and easy to contribute to. And we would love to have all of your contributions. Um, which also brings me to the point that all of the contributions that the OpenStreetMap uh, editors are making are going a long way into helping us even make this possible. So thank you all for contributing the data that makes this work. Um, also tomorrow, myself and two of my uh, coworkers will be presenting a workshop on actually making a leaflet map with a search box and then customizing that search using the Peleus uh, and Maps and Search engine. So I hope you guys can come out to that. Uh, check it out. Any questions? I think we have a lot of time for questions. I kind of rushed through the reading. Anything? Yes. Um, can you remind me again what, what powers it? Is open, ad, is open address powered? Or um, does, uh, is it just open street map addresses? Or is it open addresses as well? Or is that just sure, yeah. Um, so for the geocoding purposes, uh, we do need additional addresses. As I mentioned, uh, open street map isn't amazing for that. Um, and so we do pull in another data set, which is great. It's called Open Addresses. Um, it's basically an aggregation site for government agencies that have published their data 
um, through ArcGIS servers or just some other way. Some of it is just zip files that end up into, in the um, system. And then we pull that in, in addition to OpenStreetMap, um, venues and addresses. And then we also pull in geo names. Uh, and uh, that one has relatively rich venue data uh, as well. So we, we end up pulling that in. And then we use Who's On First, which is a Maps and um, Gazetteer. And we used to do Quattro Shapes, and we have th sw switched over to Who's On First because Who's On First took all of Quattro Shapes, improved on it, and, and now it's a living, breathing thing, whereas Quattro Shapes was something that wasn't supported anymore, unfortunately. Um, so those are the four data sets that we use. And the import pipeline is easy enough to augment if you wanted to write a custom importer for an additional data set. So if anyone knows of additional data, um, let, me, let us know, and we'll write those importers, or you're welcome to contribute by writing those uh, on your own. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Oh, the sequel? I don't know. I'll have to get back to you. I have to think of a, of a good plot for the next one. <laughs> yes? How did the coverage on non-US That's a great question. It varies by country, so I can't really speak to it. But um, because we, op we use open addresses and OpenStreetMap, we kind of get the best of both. In some cases, for address coverage, open addresses has entire countries open. Um, you know, Germany, Mexico come to mind. There's some others that have recently opened up their entire uh, data sets. And so that's been really exciting for us. It means we have rooftop coverage for addresses in those areas. Um, and then with OpenStreetMap, as you would know, it's kind of, you know, it's a mixed bag depending on the area. So most, most of the populated areas are covered really well. Um, and then some are not. Yes? Yeah, um, it's coming. Right now, we are very focused on the, uh, the English um, use case. We do support you know, countries uh, where the address is in a different format. We're actually incorporating right now um, a module called LibPostal. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but it's, um, it's a machine learning algorithm that parses addresses internationally. This address parsing is actually a very difficult problem to solve, considering that every country uh, has a unique format and all the languages and taking into consideration diacriticals and, um, you know, expanding street to SD and, you know, in all the languages. Um, so, yeah, so we're using that and we're seeing really good results. That should be coming out in a month or so uh, on the production server. It's really exciting. It's called LibPostal. Um, yeah, it, it's part of the Open Venues project on GitHub. It's also open source. It's C++. Um, I can add that to my slide, and then when I make them available um, later, you guys can get access to that. Yeah, um, yeah. the multilingual thing, it's, it's a hard problem to solve. We're working in that direction slowly. Alt names, as I mentioned in the talk, um, having alternative names for things is helping um, in that in terms of names for places, you know, countries and states and cities. If we... And OSM is good about that in a lot of cases, which is really helpful. Um, who's on first is helping in that as well. Any other questions? All right. Thank you.